Good evening. Welcome, our Sunday night here at Bunker Hill Baptist Church. Glad each and every one of you can make it tonight. Especially want to welcome those that may be joining us outside on the radio broadcast or at home. Thank you for making Bunker Hill part of your worship experience. And also those that may be joining us later online. Uh, it's been a great day in God's house. A lot's been done and a great worship tonight. Looking forward to worship. Uh, worship this morning. Looking forward to worship tonight. Just to remind you, if you have your bulletin uh, this week, there'll be a WMU meeting uh, Thursday. Uh, so pay attention to that. Just want to make sure uh, you're available for that. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and call up Dr. Pace and uh, be praying for our pastor search committee. And as we talked about this morning, please remember Gary Douglas in your prayers this morning as he prepares to go to the mission field in Mexico. Thank you, Will. I was going to show you all what Miss Wanda did. This is, the, uh, this is the couple that's getting married in April. This is Caleb and Lacey. Isn't that good? Yeah, she is really talented. That is fantastic. So uh, we appreciate that's going to be a neat wedding gift for them. Thank you so much for doing that. I can't, can't I'm going to tell them I did it. They won't believe it. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you all for being here tonight. Good to have you back. Let's, let's get started sharing the time of prayer together. We are going to pray for the pastor church committee most definitely, but we also want to pray and continue to pray for the Ukraine and the unfolding situation there and for God's sovereign touch over those peoples. Let's pray together. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening so thankful once again that we can join together on this Sunday night around the fellowship of your spirit and your word in this place, Heavenly Father. You have promised where two or three gather in your name, you are in the midst of us, Lord God. And we're just so excited to know that you live in our hearts through faith in Jesus Christ if we're Christians, Lord God. And to know that as we gather together, the, pro the promise of your spirit is, Lord God, he meets with us in this place for your purpose to accomplish your will. So, Father, we're excited and hungry to hear from from you tonight, Lord God. Father, we're so thankful to have the chance to celebrate you and praise you and adore you and exalt you, Heavenly Father. So work through this time to touch our hearts and Father, draw us closer to you. Make us more like you. Father, reveal more of yourself to us, Heavenly Father. Convict and change our hearts. Show us, Lord God, spiritual decisions and commitments and repentance that we need to make in life. And Father, do your amazing work in us and through us in this place tonight. Father, to draw us unto you, Heavenly Father, and to advance your kingdom. We would pray especially for those that are wrestling spiritually with some decision that they're being led to make. Maybe a decision of salvation. Maybe a decision to rededicate a Christian life that's gone prodigal, that's not what it should be. And tonight, Lord God, they're ready to draw that spiritual line in the sand and wholly surrender themselves to your will and your plan. Maybe to join this church family or fa maybe, Heavenly Father, to commit themselves to some calling in their life. Father, we pray tonight that you accomplish those things as well as helping all of us to grow in our faith. Father, we thank you for our pastor search committee here at Bunker Hill, Lord God, for the great work that they're doing. Father, for the diligence and devotion and prayer and searching that they're doing. Father, bless their efforts and lead them perfectly, Lord God, to that one that you're calling out, Lord God, to serve as the pastoral leader here into the future, Lord God, at this wonderful church at Bunker Hill. So continue to bless them in that process. And Father, tonight as well, we want to come and turn our hearts to you, Father, in this season of prayer and fasting that the convention has called to pray for the situation in the Ukraine. And once again, Lord God, it's one of those situations we're not sure exactly what to pray for, but Father, we know that you have a will and you have a plan. Father, we want your protection over the people, Lord God, that have been called in the midst of this conflict. Father, we want you to bring change and repentance upon the heart of those people who've committed this aggression, Heavenly Father. Lord God, we just pray that your justice, your perfect plan and will be done in this moment. Father, we especially want to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in the Ukraine. Father, there are strong, wonderful Christian churches there. We have a Baptist seminary there, wonderful Baptist churches there. Father, we pray for those brothers and sisters tonight, many of them who already are starting the process of ministering to refugees and those who've been displaced, ministering to families where deaths have occurred, Heavenly Father, ministering to people who feel a, a great sense of hopelessness tonight. And so, Father, bless the churches there, Lord God, to be a powerful force to advance the calls of Christ, <coughs> to share your love and your ministry, Father, to their country going through difficult times and put upon our hearts that we will be found faithful to daily pray for those friends, Lord God, to pray for that nation, to pray for a cessation, Lord God, and the hostilities there and to pray, Lord God, that you bring your justice to the nations in this moment. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, in the midst of the craziness of this world and our life at times that we know you are on your throne. You have a perfect plan. Whatever happens, Lord God, you're going to have the sovereign say over it. And Father,
Father, that gives us such peace in every circumstance of life. We love you, and we pray now that you use this time to glorify your name and advance your kingdom. And we lift it in Christ's name. Amen. And amen. Brother Rick, please. Amen. Lord. Thank you, Dr. Pray. So we we love you, God. How firm a foundation that we stand on. And I think we ought to stand up and sing this song. First, second, and fourth verse. 456. Join me. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, he is laid. Of course, we're going to do the first, second, and the fourth verses. How wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. How wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul.
love toward him tonight, there is a place near to the heart of God on 458, all three verses. This is our offertory hymn for tonight. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, near to Since you so richly pour out on us each and every day. Lord, we ask you to be with Brother Pace as he's about to bring the message, Lord, just give him the words that we need to hear. I always ask you to take this offering for your king's work. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>
him again. He is here. Listen closely. Hear him calling out your name. He is here. You can touch him. You will never be the same. I sense an awesome moving of the Holy Spirit. I see his countenance resting on your face. I know that there are angels hovering all around us for the presence of the Lord is in this place. I search for peace among the shadows dark and lonely. I gave up on finding that strong and lasting love. I tasted all the things that sin could think to offer me, but today I feast on manna from above. He is here, hallelujah, he is here, amen, he is here, holy, holy, I his name again he is here listen closely hear him calling out your name he is here you can touch him you will never be the same he is here him you will never be the same amen and amen thank you brother lane appreciate you sharing that so much take your bibles and turn with me tonight to proverbs chapter 3 Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to do a little different type of Bible study tonight. We're going to start in Proverbs 3, but we'll make our way around uh, to some different passages tonight as we talk about what's in a name. And basically the idea behind that topic is we have these various names throughout Scripture that God kind of puts before us in the divine inspiration of Scripture that kind of tell us who He expects us to be as Christians. So we're going to look at that tonight. By the way, I, uh, somebody said something to me recently about me putting my watch up here. I'll just tell y'all the joke that Jeff Cannon used to tell people at First Baptist Terry. Somebody asked him, this is, what does it mean when Brother John puts his watch up there on the podium? Jeff said, absolutely nothing. And so uh, y'all didn't have to laugh or amen that hard at that. But we're going to look in Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 4 as our starting point tonight. So if you would, rise with me in reverence to God and the reading of his word there tonight. And in Proverbs 3, Solomon so beautifully says, Now my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will, then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and of man. You may be seated. Let's pray together tonight. 
Heavenly Father and Almighty God, as we come to you this evening, we are so thankful to be back in your house together, to have this time to study your word. And Father, tonight, as we deal with this important topic tonight, Lord God, help us to learn from your word, that throughout all of your word, as you refer to us in divine inspiration, Lord God, you're giving us instruction to understand who you want us to be, the things you want us to accomplish, how you want us to grow, and how you want us to glorify you in this world. So as we look at these things tonight, Heavenly Father, help us learn... What's in these names, Heavenly Father, that you've placed on us as your children, as your people in this world? And Father, we pray as we study this tonight, you would hide these truths in our heart and use them to convict us in spiritual growth and maturity, Heavenly Father, to become more of the people that you want us to be. Father, we pray that these truths would convict hearts tonight of people who need to make some spiritual decision or change or repentance that you've been placing upon their heart. Bring somebody to salvation tonight. Bring somebody to rededicate their life to the lordship and authority of Jesus Christ. Father, bring some friend to join this wonderful church family and unite here in Christian growth and service and friendship. Father, bring somebody tonight to surrender to the calling you're placing upon their life, maybe in ministry or missions or some vocational calling. But Lord God, use this time for all of us to grow us in faith, Heavenly Father, to make us more of the people that you want us to be, to serve you in this world and to equip us and call us, Lord God, to serve you more effectively. And Father, we pray all these things to be done in the name of Christ and for your glory and the advancement of your kingdom in this place and through our lives. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> I'll tell you a bad joke I heard one time. It was the joke about this guy. He got on a plane. And as he got on the plane, he walked in one of those crowded flights. We've been on that before. And as he got on the plane, he sat down. And very quickly, as the plane started filling up, he looked. And the only available seat left on the whole plane was, guess where? Right next to him. And so if you've ever been in that situation, you know you start panicking about, who's going to come sit next to me, right? Who am I going to end up sitting next to? And as they were just getting ready to shut the doors, and he thought, well, I might get a seat uh, next to me that'll be empty, and that'll be great. Sure enough, somebody came on the plane, and he knew they're coming to sit next to me. Well, he looks up, and coming down the aisle to sit next to him was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his life. He thought, she must be some supermodel. And now he just started sweating bullets because this beautiful woman was going to sit next to him. And so sure enough, she came in, and she sat down, and he's just sitting there as a young single guy he was, just... just just, just, he was just a nervous wreck. But very soon he got up his energy and he got up his courage and he looked next to her and he said, listen, i got to tell you, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. I've got to ask you, what sort of men do you go out with? Who, who do you date? And so the lady looked at him and she said, well, i, I got to tell you, I like men that are tall and dark and handsome and strong, kind of like Native American Indians. And she said, but then I, I love men that are Irish, who speak with that very thick Irish brogue. I, I love that. She said, but I tell you, I also like good old boys. I like guys who drive trucks and hunt and fish. She said, by the way, my name's Christina. What's your name? He said, well, my name's Geronimo Flanagan, but my friends call me Bubba. So what's in a name? This <laughs> That's a stupid joke, isn't it? That's just a stupid joke. I apologize. Glad Dawn's not here. I'd be in trouble all the way home for telling bad jokes. <laughs> yeah, appreciate that. But when you study the Bible, one thing that comes across in the study on the Bible is how in the Bible times, Old Testament to New Testament, names are so vitally important. You know, you think about giving names to things in our day, including our children, our, our grandchildren. We kind of do it a lot of times just because we like the name or we're interested in the name. We think it's a cute name. But when you study the Old Testament to the New Testament, you'll notice that in biblical times, people were very careful about what they gave the name of something to, a person, a person. A place because when they gave names it always had meaning it always taught about some moment some situation they've gone through let me give you a few examples you'll remember the story the wonderful story of Abraham and Sarah and Abraham and Sarah are told of God that they're going to have a covenant child given to them by God, that Ishmael was not that son, that they were going to have a son. And here they are, very old people, when they get that announcement from God. And from the moment they get announcement, they have to wait 25 more years before their son is born. And at that moment that God sent messengers to Abraham and Isaac to tell them they would have a son, you remember what Sarah famously did? She laughed. And if you were 75 years old and found out you were going to have a child, you'd laugh too. 
And so they named the boy what? In Hebrew, they named him Itzhak, Isaac. And Isaac in Hebrew means what? It means laughter. And that boy's name, Isaac, always reminded them of sadly, they laughed at the power of God. They laughed at the possibilities of God. And Isaac, as they said his name every day, it reminded them of what? With God, all things are possible. God can do all things. You remember the story of Hosea and Hosea taking Gomer, that wife of ill repute, as God told him to do that. And God was literally living out in the life of Hosea and Gomer what he was experiencing with the nation of Israel. And they have children, and one of the children is named what? Lo Ruhamah. It means not loved. Well, that's a bad name to give to a child, isn't it? But it reminded Israel, sadly, they had forsaken their God. And then another child is named Loami, meaning not my people. A lot of scholars think that, pro that baby was probably illegitimate. It, it was not Hosea's child. And it pointed to the adultery that the nation of Israel was committing against Almighty God as they worship false gods. You remember coming into the New Testament times, you have the disciple named Simon. And his name is Simon all the way through Matthew chapter 16 till that one day in Caesarea Philippi where Jesus asked them, who do people say that I am? And they give him the popular opinion, but then Jesus looked at him and said, who do you say that I am? And it's Simon who says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by men, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are the rock, Peter. Petros. And Jesus gave him what? He gave him a new name. He gave him a nickname. You are Petros the rock, and upon that rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Remember in the book of Acts, there's this believer that comes into the church. His name is Joseph, but he gets the name what? Barnabas. Because Barnabas means son of encouragement or son of consolation. Because he was such a great encourager in the early church, they gave him that name. Those are just some quick examples right there of how names are so vitally important when you study Scripture. I always joke with people and tell people my name is John. In Hebrew and Greek, John means what? God's precious gift. Now, there was points that my mama looked at me and said, boy, we named you wrong. And uh, we should have picked out something else for you during some of my bad days, you know. But names carry meaning. And so then understanding that, when we come to study God's Word, we'll notice many times that God, throughout the New Testament, throughout the Old Testament, but especially the New Testament, God has these names that He gives the group that we are, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, Christians seeking to follow Christ and obey Him. And when I was doing a study one day of those names, and by the way, there's quite a few of them. We're not going to go for all of them tonight. We're going to go on the, the six main names that are put before us. I begin to understand and studying these names, not only are they great and powerful names, but these names do what? They tell you and I who Christ expects us to be. They tell you and I how God wants us to grow to be more like Him. They tell you and I about the service and ministry that God has for us to do in this world. So in a little different Bible study tonight, I want to run throughout sort of the totality of the New Testament here and give you what some of these names are. And, and spur along in our mind tonight what these names tell us about who God wants us to be, how He wants us to grow, how He wants us to serve in this world. Now the first of those that I I want to point out is what? We are called saints in the New Testament. Now that's not the saints in the Superdome. That's not the saints in New Orleans. That saints in the New Testament means what? The NIV, in fact, has gone away from using saints. Now they say holy ones is what they say. And that's what saints means. Saints, the idea of it, when I tell people a lot of times, if I've talked to them over the years, God wants you to be a saint for him. A lot of people run away from that title because they think about saints and they think about the venerated saints and the Catholic Church and things like that. And, and I'm just not a hero of faith. But look, the term saint comes from the term sanctification, right? And sanctification is what you and I are supposed to be doing as believers every day. To be sanctified means more and more through spiritual growth every day, I'm being set apart unto Christ. I'm being devoted unto Him. To be sanctified means what? To be made holy. And holy means we are set apart for the glory of Christ. We are set apart from this world and we are set apart to God to accomplish His purpose and to live for the glory of His name. 
You see that in passages like Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul will address many of his letters to the saints in the church in Ephesus. If you read NIV now, it says to the holy ones in Ephesus there. And he's speaking to them saying what? You are the ones through faith in Jesus Christ now who have been set apart unto Christ out of this world now to live by his righteousness for his glory. So that term saint there, when it's used of us, just helps you and I understand what? God has called us out of this world, but we are to be in the world, but not of the world. And he's called us out of this world to himself to love him and pursue him and serve him and glorify him. And we want to stand out as a shining light to his glory of the salvation, the transformation he can bring to the heart of a sinner and make us into his image for his glory. So the first name tonight, what's in a name, is the term saint. We are called to be saints of God, set apart to him for his glory and for his purpose. But now the second term we want to talk about is what? He has also called us to be believers. If you look in Acts chapter 2 and verse 44, there when he talks about the church at the end of the sermon of the apostle Peter in that moment, he said all the believers were together. And I love that term believers. It literally means in the Greek, the ones who have faith in, the ones who were trusting, the ones who were believing. Now we've talked about before, we got to be careful with that term believe, right? I, I, for those of us who study the New Testament and wrestle with it, believe is one of those tricky words because we don't have a verb form of faith in the English language. I, I, I've been pushing for a number of years now. I think we should use faith as a verb. We ought to say, I, I faith Jesus Christ because that's really what the word pistuo in the Greek means. It means to faith. But since we don't have a verb form of faith, we have to say what? The closest equivalent we have in the English language is believe. Now the only problem with that is you and I understand what? In the English mind, when we talk about believing things, so much of the time that has to do with what? That has to do with us intellectually thinking about things and intellectually agreeing with things. And if you're going to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you should most definitely intellectually agree with him and believe in him. But the Bible says we are to love him how? With all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Faith in Christ is not just an intellectual agreement. It's what? It's an all-encompassing commitment. Everything that I am, everything that I have, I surrender myself to him. That's what that term means. It means one's having faith in him. And faith is with all of my being surrendering to the authority and the lordship and the will of Jesus Christ. But you see there in Acts chapter 2, very early, the church is being called what? Believers. Ones who are faithing. Ones who are believing in. And for you and I, right? That's who we should be. I mean, the standard of how we're going to live our life is not what we think. It's what Christ has taught us. We believe in his word. We believe in his standard. Who our Savior is, Jesus Christ, he's not just a historical figure to us. He is what? King of kings and Lord of lords. We believe in everything the Bible says that Jesus is. He is. And I believe it not just in my brain. I believe it with my being. And I surrender myself unto Christ. And so that second name reminds us that's the type of faith that we should be giving unto Jesus Christ in our life. The third title is what? We're to be saints, we're to be believers, but we're also to be what? Disciples. In John chapter 8 and verse 31, Jesus simply said what? If you hold to my teaching, then you really are my what? Disciple. This is a very important term for us to understand. When Jesus gave us the Great Commission, he said, as you go into the world, go and make what? Disciples. In the Great Commission, the end result of service, the end result of advancing the church's work in this world, Jesus wanted not church members. I mean, a disciple should be a church member. He didn't want people who just sit in pews. I mean, disciples should sit in pews. 
Jesus wanted as the goal of the Great Commission that we be disciples who make disciples. That's what he was looking for. And so then we really need to understand what this word means. Literally the word in Greek means to sit at the feet of is what it means. It means to be a learner of somebody. It comes out of the ancient Greek world where philosophers like Socrates and Plato as they walked around and philosophized. They would have people who followed them and wrote down what they said and tried to orient their life by their teachings. They would literally, when their master started speaking, sit at the feet of him and learn from him. So that's the ancient origin of this term. But now when Jesus shows up as King of Kings, as Lord of Lords, as Almighty God incarnate in human flesh, yes, when he speaks, we sit at his feet. In fact, you remember the great story of Mary and Martha? Don't you love that story? Martha's running around trying to tend to everything in the house, and Jesus starts speaking. Mary does what? Mary sits at the feet of. Martha gets uptight, doesn't she? Lord, aren't you concerned that she's not helping me tend to all these things? And he looks at her and says what? Martha, Martha. Mary has chosen what is right. Because Jesus was speaking, it was time to be what? A disciple. It was time to sit at his feet and listen and learn. The dishes can wait. Jesus is speaking. Listen and learn and grow and submit to who I'm telling you to be and who I'm calling you to be in this world. A disciple wants to do what? A disciple wants to study the Word of God. A disciple wants to pray to Almighty God. A disciple wants to hear the Word of God preached and the Word of God taught. And we want to take all this information the Holy Spirit is convicting us with. And we want to sit at the feet of Jesus. And we want to learn from it. And we want to live what we learn. We want to apply it to our life. We want the words of Jesus Christ and the teachings of Jesus Christ to be the foundation of how I live my life every day and the person I am every day and the servant that I am in this world every day. He has called us to be his disciples. Jesus said, if you really hold to my teaching, if you obey my commands, then you really are what? My Disciples, because disciples aren't just hearing and discarding. Disciples are hearing and they're obeying. They're hearing and they're living. They're hearing and they're serving. And so that's the third term. Jesus has called us to be disciples. So we have, we are to be saints, we are to be believers, we are to be disciples, and the fourth term is what? We are to be witnesses. Famously in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said, When you receive power from on high, that is the coming of the Holy Spirit, which happened in Acts chapter 2, when you receive power from on high, he said, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and unto the ends of the earth. Y'all, the last two things Jesus says to us, we've said it before, is about what? It's about evangelism. It's about he has left this gospel message to us that we would go share it with all mankind to see sinners saved and redeemed out of their sin and living in right relationship and right fellowship and abundant life here on this earth and eternal life in heaven to come. I love the term witness because actually the Greek word for witness is martyreia. What, what word sounds like that? Martyr. To be a martyr means what? It means I die for my faith. It means I die for the cause of Christ. Christian martyrs throughout the, the, the century, the foundation of the church has been built on the blood of Christian martyrs who would not recount, who would not disregard the lordship of Jesus Christ, but would maintain it unto their death. Wasn't well, it interesting to be a witness for Christ is connected to that word. It means whatever it costs me, I am willing to stand for him. I'm willing to share his love and to share his word at all costs to be out there sharing the gospel to see people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And one thing that is constantly put before us in the New Testament is what? That's our calling. That's our standard. That's who we're supposed to be. We are his witnesses. I love in Acts 1-8 the connection that's made there basically is what? When you receive power from on high... You will be my witness. Do you see the grammatical connection? 
The grammatical connection kind of flows like this. If you have really received the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ, you really had a moment of repentance, faith, surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit has come upon you, then a natural reaction of His presence is what? I'm going to tell others. I will be His witness. It's not a special program of my life. It's my lifestyle. It's who I am. That when God gives me opportunity to share Jesus with somebody, to share my testimony with somebody, to share the gospel with somebody, he doesn't have to beg me and beat me to do that. We act like it's an extraordinary thing to do, right? It's supposed to be a common thing in our life. If we receive the Holy Spirit, then one natural outflow of that is God's going to give me opportunities to be his witness, and I'm committed to do it. I try to tell people all the time, when you think about evangelism, when you think about witnessing, don't think about it as a special program. Think about it as a normal activity of life. A common thing that's probably going to happen every day where God's going to open a door where you can share your faith, share Christ, share your testimony with somebody, be looking for it, be praying for it, be ready for it, and be obedient to do it when He provides the opportunity. We are to be, one of the names we're given is His witness in this world. Well, then the fifth one is what? We are to be saints. We are to be believers. We are to be disciples. We are to be witnesses. And then the fifth one, and I love this one, we are to be his servants. In fact, when you talk about this term, the Apostle Paul, when he talks about himself, this is Paul's favorite term to call himself. Paul could have called himself a lot of things, right? He could have called himself minister, preacher, missionary. He could have called himself a lot of things. But his favorite term to call himself is what? To call himself a servant. For example, look in Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. The Apostle Paul, when he writes his letters, and you'll see this in so many of his letters, he does what? In ancient times, they signed their letters up front. They didn't sign them at the back end like we do. Ancient times, they signed them up front. And he will say, Paul, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ to the church, to the Christians in Rome. When he identifies himself in his letters, he uses this term. Now, what's the term he uses? Over and over again, the term that he uses, Paul calls himself a doulos. And this is the same term that when it's put before you and I, who we're supposed to be for Jesus Christ in this world, we are to be his servant. This is the term that's used. And it's a very interesting term. To be a doulos in the first century world, the literal way we translate that is to be a bond slave or a bond servant. Now, what's happening there? This is where you've got to understand a little bit about the first century world. In the first century world, if you owed somebody a debt, you were indebted to somebody, and you could not pay that debt, you didn't have the money to pay it, guess how you had to pay it? You had to become their doulos their bond slave. And you had to give yourself in debtor slavery to this person until you worked off the debt that you owed them. Can you imagine if we had that in the 21st century now, y'all? I, I, I saw, a, I saw a, a stat about six months ago. It said the average American family nowadays spends 132% of their income. We don't have 132% of our income. That's how in debt we are in America. Can you imagine nowadays if we had debtor slavery and I couldn't pay off my debt, I had to give myself in slavery to that debt holder. That's literally what's happening in the first century. And when you found yourself in that position, you were called a doulos. So you understand that this term right here that Paul uses, this term right here that the church put out before us about who we're supposed to be is not necessarily a real wonderful term in the first century world. But the church got it right, didn't they? You can see why they chose this term, why Paul chose this term to put, put out before us as a standard of who we're supposed to be. Because y'all, let's talk about the debt that we owed. The debt that we owed was what? Our sin debt. And our sin debt before God is what? It is a debt that I could never pay on my own. I can't do enough good works. I can't think enough good thoughts. I can't be on my own a good enough person to attain to the holiness of perfection that is Almighty God. 
And therefore I am before him eternally as a sinner, deserving and worthy of his judgment, except that he chose in love to do what? To send Jesus Christ to die on the cross in my place for my sins, to pay my debt. When Jesus died on the cross, he cried out what? Tetelestai. It is finished. It's literally a business term that means paid in full. I mean, Jesus is literally saying on the cross, the debt is paid. What debt's he talking about? He's talking about our sin debt. And so here Jesus paid that debt that we owe. And now the Christians are saying what using this term? Well, I can't ever do enough good works to pay Jesus back for the debt that he paid for me. But I'm going to give my life in thanksgiving to live for him, to praise him for the debt that he paid upon Calvary's cross. That's how Paul saw himself. I'm a bond slave unto Jesus because he paid my sin debt that I could never pay on my own. And it motivated him then in thanksgiving, in love, in devotion, and dedication to go out and live to the glory of Christ every day. So that's the servant we are to be. And then the last term is what? We are to be saints. We are to be believers. We are to be disciples. We are to be witnesses. We are to be servants. And then the last term, we are Christians. We are Christians. You know, early on, they weren't called Christians. You know that. In fact, it takes till Acts chapter 11 and verse 25 that at Antioch, believers were first called Christians at Antioch. Up to that time, they were called followers of the way, it seems, was the most popular term for them. Because Jesus had said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. <clears throat> no man comes to the Father except through me. So Christians were known as followers of the way. But now at Antioch in Acts chapter 11, for the first time, they're called Christians. What does Christian mean? Literally, in, in every language, it means to be a Christian. It means we are of Christ. And what that term means is, I belong to him. I have surrendered to him. When I say I'm a Christian, it's a way of saying that I have completely surrendered my life to Jesus as my master and my Lord. I belong to him. He is my sovereign king. He is ruler over my life. But also to be called a Christian means what? I'm of Christ in the fact that I reflect his nature. And I reflect his character. If I belong to him, then I live like him and I walk like him and I serve like him. And people, as they watch me, they get a small glimpse of what? Who Jesus is and who he wants us to be in love and ministry and service and devotion and holiness and righteousness and love and care for the world around us. So to call ourselves a Christian is not some simple little term. It's an amazing thing to say that I belong to him, he is my sovereign authority, and then I will ref reflect who he is in my character, in my life, in my service that I live in this world every day. When I did this Bible study a number of years ago for the first time, I tell you, I walked away from that with those six terms. And by the way, there's more you can find. We are to be children of God. That's another great term. There's others out there. But these are sort of the six key and I began to look at that list, and it really helped to drive home to me. Again, this is who Christ has saved me and called me to be. This is the expectations of living and service that Jesus has for me. And y'all, it's a holy and a beautiful and a glorious and an eternity-shattering thing to realize that I get to bear his name that I get to say that I belong to him through faith in Christ as I've repented of my sins and surrendered to him in faith and lordship. And isn't it a glorious thing to have Christ in our heart and to bear his name for his will and for his purpose. I went back home many years ago now to Reeds Baptist Church in Reeds, North Carolina, a suburb of Lexington. Trust me, neither one of them are real big. But that's my home church. And every once in a while they call me and they invite me to come back and preach. And I get to go back and preach in my home church, the, the pulpit that my dad pastored in for 24 years. 
My dad pastored for 42 years, 24 of those right there at Reed's Baptist Church, and left an amazing legacy in that church. And so I, I went back on this morning to preach, and I'm, I'm looking out, and I'm, I'm preaching to a lot of people I've known all my life there. And there were some guests and visitors who came in that knew dad, but uh, you know, had, didn't really know me that well, and they wanted to come home, I guess, and see what John's boy you know, looked like as a preacher. And so after I got done preaching that day, I, I went out to shake hands at the back door. And coming out the door, I could look and see coming ahead was an old preacher. It was a friend of my father's. But I don't guess he'd ever probably heard, heard me preach or he'd been around my ministry at all. And I couldn't wait to say hey to him because I knew who he was and I, I knew he was a friend of dad and I, I couldn't wait to catch up with him. And as that old preacher made his way to the back door, he walked up to me and I was about to say hey to him and he just grabbed my hand and he pulled me in and he just bear hugged me. And as he bear hugged me, he whispered in my ear and he said this, he said, boy, you do your daddy's name proud. And when he let me go, I started crying. He, he walked with my dad. He ministered with my dad. And that was a special thing to hear him say, boy, you do your daddy's name proud. And I got home that afternoon. I was kind of processing that. And I said, you know, that blessed me, but... More importantly than my father, I want to do Abba, Daddy's name, proud. Because of the blessing of the names he has given me, I want to be found faithful to Daddy, my father, to glorify him and to live for his purpose and his will. And then it made me ask the question when it comes to Abba, Father, do I do his name proud? He's laid out for me here pretty clearly throughout all of Scripture. Here's another way to look at it through these lists tonight. But in these expectations, in these callings, these blessings and opportunities he gives, do I do his name proud? By being the servant, the believer, the Christian, the disciple, the witness that he wants me to be. Glorifying him, bringing honor to him, shining a light that will point people to him, and advancing his kingdom and his purpose and his will in this world. Because, y'all, in the end, that's all that matters that we do our Father's name proud. And we live for his glory, and we serve for his plan and for his majesty. So I just ask you in closing tonight. That list, I didn't make that list up. I just worked through that list in the New Testament of looking at these names that we're given under the divine inspiration of Almighty God. And this is who he expects us to be. This is what he has called us to do. The question is, is that you? Are you doing those things? Is that your character? Is that your nature? Is that your service? Is that your mission? Because that's who we're supposed to be. That's why he's made us. That's why he's created us. That's why he has saved us. That's why he's redeemed us. That's why he has filled us. That's why he has called us. To glorify him and advance his purpose. And I got on my knees that day and I dealt with that about myself. Am I being these things to your glory? I simply ask you tonight to think about that list and Answer that under the conviction of the Holy Spirit before God for yourself. Is this who you are? Is this your passion and your focus? Because God's telling you through his word, this is who I want you to be. And it's here that we find abundant life. It's here that we know the fullness of eternal life in Christ. And in this invitation time, if there is some conviction God's placed upon your heart about something that needs to be corrected, something that needs to be changed, something that needs to be done so you can rightly be walking in the fullness of his plan and his expectations, dear friend, I beg of you, come forward. We would love to counsel you in that. Getting saved, 
handling doubts about your salvation, maybe finally getting dead serious about the authority and the lordship of Christ and surrendering to him in rededication and commitment tonight, maybe joining this church family, maybe wrestling with a calling he's placing in your life. Whatever it is, don't say no to Jesus. Live with a yes laid out before him. And you'll be amazed at the life he has for you. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in closing tonight, and we thank you so much for this chance to study your word this evening. Father, to be convicted by the truths that we have found there, Lord God. Father, we thank you throughout your word that you make so clear to us, Heavenly Father, who you want us to be and how you want us to grow and the righteousness that you want us to live, the service that you want us to do. Father, it's not hard to figure it out. It's not hard to find it. And Father, when we find it, we find the glory of abundant life in you. Don't let a friend in here tonight miss that. Because, Father, they chose sin instead of the Savior. Father, if there's a decision, a commitment, a change that needs to be made tonight, bring that friend forward right now for counsel. And, Father, do all these things for your glory, your honor, and the blessing of these friends. We lift it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing, You Come As We Sing. 439, Jesus, I come. Out of my bonded sorrow and night, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come, out of my sin. God bless you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for being here all, all day today. Look forward to seeing you next Sunday. We'll lead us in close. Thank you again. I know that I love you and there's nothing you can do about that. Have a great week. Been encouraged and thank you, Dr. Pace, for your message. And just hope you take that message wherever you go. Brother Jim, Jim Tom Allen, if you pray for us, please.